All right, let's do this. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Our Watch with Tim Thompson, special Saturday night edition. Uh, we're glad you guys are all here, those that are here with us tonight, and those that are watching online, welcome. Um, we have a great interview tonight, Assemblyman Kevin Kiley uh, and uh, gubernatorial candidate and the recall election is joining us tonight, so thank you for coming on out for that. Um, and before we go too much further, would you join me as we pray for tonight's program? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we can come together here and have the freedom to do that here in your house tonight. And uh, we just lift up the, the program and the interview between Pastor Tim and Assemblyman Kylie tonight, that it would be one that really equips and educates people with the information that they need to know to be able to make wise decisions. Uh, and we pray that this, uh, this program tonight would reach far and wide uh, through the online audience. And uh, we just ask for your blessing and protection uh, over all of it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, for those of you that are here tonight, we are taking an offering for our watch. Um, if you're willing and able to help support our watch and what we do, we thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for being here anyways. And if you're watching online, you can go to ourwatchnow.com forward slash donate if you would like to help contribute to the cause there as well. Um, just a couple other announcements. Um, I want to let you know if you didn't know already, and we're talking about the recall election, Bring your ballots here. If you want to make sure that they go where they need to go and you can trust where they're going to be going, um, we are receiving ballots here. Uh, we're doing that legally. And so um, if you have them tonight, you can drop them off with the person who is over the ballot box uh, out in the fellowship area. And uh, if you are coming to church here tomorrow, you can bring them to church with you uh, or next Wednesday night as well. So I just want to let you know this is a place where you can get your ballots turned in safely. Uh, also, for those of you that are here uh, tonight in the building, uh, go talk to our school choice representative in the fellowship area as well. And school choice is an excellent program. Uh, there has been a pre-petition going. They're not doing that tonight, but what they are doing is looking for help from volunteers. So if you want to be part of the school choice mission um, and you want to help volunteer to get the word out, uh, maybe show up to some events and help spread the word. That would be great. So just go out and talk to the person there about that for school choice. Uh, also, some upcoming things that we've got going on. Let's see. Next Wednesday, September 8th, Charlie Kirk. Yes. We are blessed to finally be able to have Charlie come into the program. And he's going to be joined by Pastor Rob McCoy as well. So that is what, next Wednesday, September 8th. Make sure you get here early to be able to get a seat. Uh, also want to let you know, um, we went through a real rough round of closures in this last year of things being shut down and locked down and not knowing what the future holds exactly. Um, we are developing a movement right now called Never Closing. You probably heard us talk about this a little bit before. Uh, and what this is all about is we want to be able to make a resource for churches and businesses that are committed to staying open and are rejecting the concept of closing down their church or their business if this were to happen again uh, in the event of another lockdown. So what you can do now is go to neverclosing.org. And if you have a business uh, and you want to add your business there because you're going to commit to staying open in the future, no matter what, then you can add your business on there. It's free. If you are watching online and you're part of a church, uh, you can ask your church leadership to go on there and add the church there as well. And this is going to be a great resource for people to find out in the event of any kind of lockdown in the future, what churches and local businesses are open. So neverclosing.org. Uh, if you haven't already... Join the email list, uh, the RWatch email list. You could do that at rwatchnow.com. Um, just add your information there, and you will make sure that you will be getting the most current and up-to-date information about events and future guests coming on the program. Uh, you can also find out all those details if you are following us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and if you're watching right now online, you're either watching on YouTube or Rumble, so would you please share this out right now, send out a link to all your social media friends, let them know to join in and watch, uh, make sure that you're liking and subscribing to the channel as well, and that way you get the notifications about what's coming up and what we're doing here. So uh, also want to let you know, for those that are local to this area, uh, if you're part of the church, um, and it, actually, even if you're not, we're going to be live streaming this. I just realized that. We're going to be live streaming. Monday morning is Rosh Hashanah. 
And so here at the church, Pastor Tim is going to be leading a Bible study. This is just going to be a one-time special Bible study at 9 a.m. here at 412 Murrieta. So you can watch that on the 412 Murrieta uh, YouTube and Rumble channel Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Or come on down and show up and take part in that with us. Uh, so that's about all I got for you guys now. I'll be getting started with the program in just a few moments. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our watch with Tim Thompson. This past year, the radical left with their globalist mindset has burned down our cities, forced businesses to close, and tried to silence our churches. They told us to wear a mask and stay home to save lives, and many Christians remain silent. That is no longer an option. The silent majority will be silent no more, and the sleeping giant has been awakened. We are going to use our voice to take back the media, stop the censorship, and very loudly take back the public square. I'm Tim Thompson, and this is Our Watch. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm so grateful to have you all out here, especially on a holiday weekend like this. We've got Labor Day coming up this Monday, and uh, there's a lot going on out in the world, but you all took time to uh, come into church and hear what Kevin Kiley has to say tonight, and, and uh, just grateful for you for doing that. I also want to say hello to everybody that's tuned in online. Glad you're with us as well, and I just want to remind all of you that are here and everybody that is watching online why we're doing this, why we... Uh, uh, why would a pastor talk about these political issues? And I believe this. I believe what Ezekiel chapter 3 says. In fact, I believe what all of the Bible says, front to back. Uh, but I believe Ezekiel 3, where God calls Ezekiel a watchman, and he tells him, when I warn you about something, it's your job to let everybody know. And if they decide to listen to you, and they, they hear the warnings, and they repent, and they get their life back on track, then great. You've saved them. Awesome. Um, but but if you don't warn them and they end up dying in their sin, then it's on you. And that's the way I view this is there's a lot going on. We're, we've got our eyes open. We're paying attention to what's going on in our culture and around the world. And the pastors should be telling people, hey, these are the things that God said in his word that we should be looking for. These are the things that are happening and we need to be very well aware. And so I, I look at it that way. We are watchmen and we, we all are watchmen in a sense. And so I want to make sure that we get good information to you and that way you can help send Sound the alarm to your friends, your family, and your neighbors. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I do want to thank you for coming out tonight. And I have uh, with me to, tonight a, a very special guest that's going to invite up our guest tonight. Many of you have seen uh, her. She's been on our watch before. Um, she's been here with her husband, Dr. Jeff Barkey. This is Mary Barkey. She's on the Orange County Board of Education. And so that's a, a huge thing, for, especially for us at Our Watch, because you know the heart that we have for children and how open our eyes are to what they're doing doing to indoctrinate our kids, and it, that, that's been just a, a huge thing for us because we've literally been calling the public school system the indoctrination factory, and so it, it's just a, a blessing to know that there are people like you who will bring a voice of reason to the Orange County Board of Education, and the Orange County Board actually has some pretty good people on that. I, I'm wishing that the actual individual school districts would get people like you on them. Um, but this is a massive fight we're in. You've been definitely helping to lead the charge in that. We're grateful for you. And so, Mary Barkey, would you please uh, introduce up your friend and our guest this evening? I would love to do that. 
Um, thank you all for being here. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to introduce my favorite candidate for governor. Don't tell anybody, but he's definitely my favorite. He's an amazing assemblyman. He is the son of a special needs teacher. He was a teacher himself in Los Angeles. He is an attorney. He was the guy who sued the governor and won. Yes, gotta love that. And he is out there fighting for us every single day. The reason we had to invite you here on the weekend rather than our normal Wednesday is because during the week he's fighting for us in the assembly. He's one of the few people there that fights for the kids. He fights for school choice. He fights for freedom. And I know on day one he's going to remove the emergency order that will give all of us our freedom back. So. So I'm very, very excited to introduce to you tonight Assemblyman Kevin Kiley. Assemblyman Kiley, thank you for coming out. Appreciate My pleasure. you being thanks here Thanks for having with us. me. And thanks yeah. for altering your schedule. I appreciate it. No problem. <laughs> um, it, you know, for me, it's... Um, it's important for me as a pastor, I don't know if you could hear me from over there, but just as a pastor trying to speak into the culture that we live in, and I think a lot of pastors have disengaged from the culture, and because one thing that you know and I know is that the radical left, what they like to do is politicize biblical moral issues. It's not politics, it's Bible. Right. And, and when they do that, what happens is a lot of pastors hide behind their pulpit and go, oh, I can't talk about that, that's politics. Well, if they politicize life, and they politicize borders, and they politicize marriage and gender and sexuality, and all of these things that are very biblical issues, and we go, well, we can't talk about it, that's politics, that's a problem. And so I, I'm trying to engage in those things, and so for me it's very important that people like you come out. We've actually, um, in the past, uh, come, leading up to this September 14th, we've actually had on the program Major Williams, we had John Cox, we had Anthony Termino, um, Larry Elder was scheduled, but then he, he had to cancel because he had something else going on. Um, but then we had you, um, you were very flexible with everything else you have going on. You, you gave us a date and we accommodated the date and we're just glad that you took the time to be here with us because my hope is this. I don't tell people necessarily who to vote for, I tell them how to vote. And for me, it's voting who we believe is closest to the heart of God. And how can people do that if they don't get a chance to meet the person and hear from them directly, ask them their questions. And that's why we're, we're grateful that you took time to do that. And um, we, we got a lot of things we want to talk to you about up here. But then also for the people that, that are here in the audience, I know that afterwards they'd love to meet you and, and be able to talk to you directly. So that's the point of what we're doing. So glad you are here. Let's go ahead and get into it. I want to open up with, to me, what is uh, the most important question. Would you tell us what your faith is and, and kind of unpack that for us a little bit? What, what do you believe in and how is that driving what you do in life? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let me just say, uh, first, thank you everyone for being here and thank you for the opportunity and thank you for being a leader and a fighter, uh, you know, over this last year and a half. Thank you. So important. And, you know, that's why I, I really wanted to make this happen, because, uh, you know, it's people like you who I think are, are leading uh, our state out of, and our country out of this dark era of government control. And uh, perhaps we can light a new spark of liberty and uh, renew so. our commitment to the Constitution, you know, th little things like that. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm a Christian. Uh, I was actually raised Catholic. We were just talking, but uh, I, uh, you know, uh, generally uh, go to Protestant church these days, although I still go to Catholic church every now and then. Um, but uh, it is, uh, you know, obviously uh, foundational to who you are as a person, uh, is, is to be uh, a person of faith. And there are some who would say that somehow this needs to be, you know, walled off from politics in some sense. And I'll tell you, I was actually, uh, I got a call from the LA Times today, and they asked me about this event, and they asked me about going to God Speak tomorrow, mm -hmm. and uh, they asked about a couple other appearances that, that Larry's making at churches, and they're like, what's going on with going to churches for a campaign? What's that all about? Is this a separate violation of the separation of church and state? I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> that's not what it is. Uh, you know, for example, I'm, uh, if I recall, it was uh, the civil rights movement actually grew out of the Christian church, right. was led by a pastor. Uh, that's never the way, uh, you know, we've understood the relationship 
uh, between faith and politics. Of course, if you're a person of faith, it's going to guide the way uh, you approach uh, issues. And uh, it's, it's impossible to, to separate that from your, uh, your political persona, from uh, you know, the values that you bring to bear uh, as a policymaker. And so I think that uh, having these discussions is, is really a healthy and, and helpful thing. And there's, it's absolutely nothing that, uh, you know, that we should shy away from. So um, going from Catholic to being an evangelical or Protestant, um, that's, that was kind of my journey too. I'm oldest of eight kids, big Catholic family. In fact, we always joke around because we're Irish, so we always say our, member, our family's all members of the CIA. That's the Catholic Irish alcoholics. That's, <laughs> like we always find our family, you know, when our family goes on vacation, they just go to a different bar. So we might be that's, related. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I joke around about that whole Catholic thing because, you know, the thing is, it really was a great foundational thing for me growing up. Um, but obviously, as, a, as an evangelical pastor, uh, for me, there was just doctrinal things for me that, that I struggled with. And, and I found myself in a place where I, I really firmly believe in, in what, I, what I preach and what I know. Um, but even, even growing up in the Catholic household, I was raised by... Um, people who loved the Lord and, and really wanted me to have that, that foundation in my life. So you're, you've done that, but, but your whole family moved from Catholicism to uh, Protestantism, and yeah. now you even have a brother. <laughs> you have a brother who's a pastor. and That's right. Right? Absolutely. He's a yeah. pastor at a church called Bridgeway Christian Church, which is in Roseville in the district I represent. Okay. All right. Well, so I, I want to ask you another question, which to me... Um, was, was probably the single most intriguing thing about you um, was the fact that you sued our governor in the midst of the pandemic. It was my pleasure, believe me. <laughs> well, it was, it was our pleasure as well. When we got that yeah. news, we were like, yes. Um, I want to read just a, a portion of what was uh, put out by the courts that day, and then I want to have you, because you've got, you've got multiple degrees, uh, Harvard, Yale, and... Uh, I also have an education degree because I was a teacher for okay. a little while at uh, Loyola Marymount. Okay, so um, so you're smarter than me. So I'm going to read this, <laughs> and then we'll have you kind of explain this. But here's here's what it says: Executive Order uh, N6720 issued by the governor on June. 3rd. 3rd, 2020, is void as an unconstitutional exercise of legislative power and shall be no further force or effect. The California Emergency Services Act um, does not authorize or empower the governor of the state of California to amend statutory law or make new statutory law, which is exclusively a legislative function not delegated to the governor under the CESA. Go ahead and unpack that for us. I didn't understand any of that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this was uh, the ruling that came down from a superior court uh, in Northern California. Uh, we had, and it was uh, James Gallagher and I, who's another member of the legislature, uh, who represents a district in Northern California. Uh, great, great assembly member. And uh, we actually represented ourselves. We're, the, the legislature decided, oh, we're just not going to work anymore. Uh, so it, it adjourned sort of indefinitely, uh, let the governor take everything over. And we're like, we got to do something about this because he had decided just to rule the state by decree. He was issuing executive order after executive order. A lot, a lot of things that had nothing really to do with COVID. He was just sort of, we'd become a one-man government. And we're like, we got to do something about this as legislators. This is, these are our powers, actually, <laughs> to like make laws. That's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, you know, that's what you learn about in school. We have an executive branch, legislative branch, and judicial branch. Uh, so we decided to sue him, and we also said, well, we're lawyers by trade. Why don't we just represent ourselves? And so we went and got a preliminary injunction initially, uh, and then the trial ended up being in November, and you know, we wrote all the briefs ourselves, did all the arguments ourselves, uh, and whatnot. And uh, it was actually one of the most amazing days of my life when we arrived uh, for this trial. Uh, because, you know, we're kind of preparing for all of this in obscurity, you know, you're just kind of writing these briefs, uh, it's hundreds of pages of briefs that we did by the time this thing was over. And so I show up uh, at the courthouse and it's completely packed, the parking lot, and so I have to kind of park someplace off that. I get there and there's just hundreds and hundreds of people who have showed up uh, to like support us at this trial and to, uh, you know, support this effort to reign the governor. And I would later learn that it was mostly led by uh, the then sort of building uh, recall movement. Uh, but uh, that was kind of the moment I realized this recall, that something's going on here. And uh, so we ended up winning the trial. 
And the finding by the judge was that the particular order we had challenged, because you have to, you know, there was a lot we could have challenged, you have to pick one, uh, it was unconstitutional, not within the governor's powers, and she issued a restraining order saying he can't do things like this going forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, in my view, that would have been applicable to things like the lockdowns as well. That if you're going to do something like that, which it's not even clear you, uh, you know, should be able to do at all, uh, but if you're going to, then the legislature needs to be involved. The governor can't just come up with it and then impose it on everyone else. So, Long story short, uh, he ended up getting a very favorable panel of judges on the Third District Court of Appeals, uh, and they ended, who had all worked, all three of them had worked for governors, uh, and they ended up reversing that decision. And then, in what is truly just kind of shocking to me, uh, the California Supreme Court refused to hear the case. Uh, refused to hear the case. It was four justices appointed by Jerry Brown, one by Gavin Newsom. And that shocked you, that they refused to hear the case? Well, That I guess doesn't shock me. <laughs> Shock is maybe the wrong word. I just think it's so unacceptable. That there they did you go. That. Okay. And because I mean, you'll get other states where there have been challenges to governor's overreach of authority, which has been nowhere close to what Gavin Newsom has done. However, they've come out. It's the state's highest court that has always decided the issue. And this is the issue of our time. You know, whether we are going to just surrender the form of government that has worked pretty well in this country uh, for 200 plus years, uh, right? And we decide, well, we're just going to let this opinion from three randomly chosen justices, randomly, I say, quote unquote, on the third district court of appeals uh, to, to have the, the binding decision on this. So, you know, that's why I say, now we're seeking justice at the ballot box. Uh, that's what the opportunity we have in 10 days. And I'll say there's just one side note on this. Uh, one of the most important powers a governor has is the power to appoint judges. And I'd appoint judges who actually respect the Constitution. Sort of a, a novel idea. He did, by the way, Gavin Newsom, just yesterday, he went on like a judge appointing binge. He appointed 23 judges. And so, I don't know, maybe he thinks he might have, not have the power to appoint judges pretty soon. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty telling. If, yeah, that's crazy. Um, the American dream uh, is something that's important to me. You know, um, you, you may know um, Mike Morrell, former senator. Mike Great Morrell, man. And a good friend of mine. And one of the things that he's always said, when, when the first time he said it, it just like it resonated in my mind. And it just, I've never let it go. Um, biblically, and the, uh, you know, so you know him. You know he's a man that God's word flows out of his mouth. I mean, he just, it's yes. in his heart, so it comes out of his mouth. Um, the Bible tells us that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And what Mike Morrell told me, he says, you know, Tim, it's more than money. We need to be able to leave an America to our children's children, the kind of America that we got the privilege to grow up in, That's right. and we're seeing that being stripped away really quick. And there's two amendments that, to me, are are the ones that are just flashing right now. That that, that it's so obvious that they're trying to be stripped from us. And I want to get your take on it. If you were to be governor, um, we've got the First Amendment and the Second Amendment. You know, gun, gun rights are being stripped from Californians constantly. If you were a governor, what would you do to ensure that our first and our second, well, all our rights, but specifically because these are the ones we see are very much under attack, what would you do to ensure that we get to maintain our first and second amendment rights? And as someone who's soon to be a grandfather, as mm -hmm. I understand, uh, you know, that quote probably has some resonance with you, oh, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, um, I mean, you're absolutely right that uh, we have a state government that even before COVID uh, would run roughshod over our constitutional rights. Uh, let's, I mean, we could go through them all, but we'll start with the First Amendment. Uh, you know, obviously there have been attacks on religious liberty that predate even uh, the COVID uh, shutdowns. Uh, it's been building for a long time. Uh, there has been, they've gone after, for example, the private Christian colleges uh, time and again. I've got one of them in my district, William Jessup University. Uh, and uh, the United States Supreme Court even had to strike down a couple years ago a California law on First Amendment grounds, which required pri uh, crisis pregnancy centers, you're familiar with this law, I'm sure, to mm -hmm. post uh, at their facility mm -hmm. where, you, where the nearest Planned Parenthood was or where you could obtain access to an abortion. Uh, this is a law passed and signed uh, by the state of California. The United States Supreme Court struck that down on First Amendment grounds. Netta Hegera is the attorney that worked on that. And, and she's a friend of ours. She's actually our, our attorney here at the church. Oh, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and it was, uh, um, then it was uh, Go Mobile for Life, which was a mobile ultrasound thing that got absorbed by uh, Birth Choice. I'm on the board for Birth Choice. So we were very familiar with that case, and, and it was something that we were celebrating. I mean, just what a great win. That's, a, that's an incredible win. 
Yes, and a very important one. Uh, and that was, it was actually on free speech grounds uh, because the First Amendment, of course, protects your right to freedom of speech against government interference. It also means that the government cannot force you to engage in speech uh, that runs against you know, your values. And so forcing them to do that, the US Supreme Court said, uh, was a violation of the First Amendment. So the First Amendment has five freedoms in it. There's speech, there's uh, you know, for free exercise and, uh, and the Establishment Clause. Uh, and I think that you know, one of the, I think, important opportunities we have right now in California is that we have just seen over the course of the last year and a half kind of everything that was already wrong here taken to the nth degree, like put on steroids. Mm -hmm. And so we'd had attacks on religious liberty for a long time in California. Then we had the very worst uh, you know, uh, violations of, of religious liberty of any state in the country uh, during COVID-19. Uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, uh, the US Supreme Court had to slap down Gavin Newsom's orders five times, uh, you know, not only related to churches, but to in-home Bible studies and other private gatherings. And so uh, I think that, you know, this is a chance for us as a people uh, to reject what he did during COVID, but to also turn the page on this long standing, uh, these long standing abuses, the long standing disparagement of religious freedom by putting worship and fellowship beyond the reach of any bureaucrat. So we've covered a few of the First Amendment freedoms. Do you want me to yeah. go to the Second Amendment? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, one last thing on the first one, because you talked about the compelled speech. Yes. They can't force you to say something that goes against your, your own um, convictions. Right. Um, that being said, what we're finding in the state is laws that have been created because there is a supermajority in the state legislature against people like me, um, laws have been created that, that really have been bad for, for conservative teachers. Um, take, for instance, a transgender issue. Mm -hmm. You know, telling a teacher if you don't use a preferred pronoun, if you could see clearly that the child is a male child, but the child wants to be referred to by female pronouns, and you don't use that, then you can be in big trouble as a teacher in California. What, what are your thoughts on that type of compelled speech? Because that is not something that's going to go away anytime soon in right. the state of California. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And, uh, you know, it's, it's another example of what is so fundamentally wrong about the way education works in California is you have that level of minutia regulated at the state level telling every teacher in every school in the state that this is what you have to do. Uh, that's not the way it ought to work, uh, which is why I'm a, a huge advocate for school choice. And I think that's another uh, way in which, you know, we need to use uh, sort of this uh, last year and a half where uh, we've reached kind of the, uh, the maximum level of, of, uh, of government abuse with schools just being closed altogether uh, to turn the page on the abuses that had already been building up. We already had, you know, uh, the, uh, among the worst public schools in the country uh, even before COVID. So uh, I, you know, uh, I think that at the end of the day, if you have a uh, robust, meaningful system of school choice, then if that sort of thing is going on, uh, then you can take your child or in, you know, and the funding goes with them elsewhere. And if you're a teacher, uh, you can go and teach at another venue where those sort of things uh, don't happen. You've actually introduced some very significant legislation on the, the subject of school choice. Yes. How's that going for you? For well, us? <laughs> <laughs> they refused to even hear it. Can you believe that? They did not give even legislators a choice over school choice legislation. This is the way our legislature works. It's the same thing uh, with, uh, you've probably heard of AB 455, mm -hmm. which we've managed to kill for the year, uh, but they just kind of uh, come up with this two weeks before the legislature adjourn and uh, turn a toll road, road bill into you know, this uh, thing that runs completely contrary to uh, America's founding values, something that's never happened in this country before. And so our legislature, I mean, I've been there five years, I can tell you it's a total sham. Like, we do not have a true representative process uh, in this state, which is kind of like why it wasn't such a big deal that the legislature more or less disappeared last year. You know, it's, it's lobbyists and special interests who run it anyway, so maybe it's just easier if they tell the governor directly what they want to do. Okay, you know, Gavin Newsom, you shut down the schools. Then we don't have to wrangle with 120 different legislators. Uh, so uh, I am uh, supporting an initiative on the ballot next year uh, that is going to actually uh, put funding, you know, have the funding follow uh, the student. And uh, I think that with, you know, the recall, uh, if it is successful, and then that initiative on the horizon, there will actually be an opportunity to try to induce the legislature uh, to pass some form of meaningful school choice. Yeah, school choice is going to be a massive issue for us come that, come that if we can get that on the ballot. It, it, we have to find a way to take back control from the CTA, take back control with these local unions, um, local associations, because 
that is the indoc I, I call the public school system the indoctrination factory. That's, that's where it's at. And we have to be able to find a way to create competition within the schools. That's right. And, and that's what school choice will do. Um, you, you mentioned AB 455 is dead till next year. We still have AB 1102. Right. Uh, with that, where, where's that one at? Uh, so not entirely clear. Uh, the <laughs> language still is not in print, uh, which is incredible. The legislature adjourns for the year on Friday and you're gonna try to ram this thing through, which still, at this moment, what's today? Saturday? Uh, so legislature adjourns in less than a week, and you're gonna have this bill uh, go through. I mean, there's no opportunity for public input, public for deliberation. I mean, even the, the bare sort of remnants of those things that we have in our ordinary legislative process uh, doesn't exist. And, you know, that is, I think, another sort of overarching theme of the recall, is that this is a chance to bring power back to the people, to reclaim control over our state government. After a year and a half, when we've been told, your voice does not matter, the only voice that matters is one person's, Gavin Newsom's. He's gonna issue order after order after order, and that means you need to shut down your church, Pastor. Sorry, there's nothing you can do about it. You need to shut down Wanna your bet? small business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, let's give a round of applause. <laughs> um, Okay, so Second Amendment, we, we, we didn't right, tackle we that one yet. Okay. Yeah, all right. So, I mean, we have uh, like the craziest gun laws in the country in California. Uh, I've got a perfect rating from all the, uh, the Second Amendment groups, but it's really not that hard just because what's being proposed is just so clearly uh, bad that it's, you know, there's no question of whether to vote against it. Uh, but, uh, and I've also proposed some legislation to try to uh, strengthen Second Amendment rights. Uh, so, uh, and ironically, you know, there is one group who sort of has uh, been treated kind of well when it comes to firearms, and that's criminals. Uh, when it comes to the <laughs> the use of guns in the commission of crimes, somehow we keep lowering the penalties for that or not really taking it seriously when felons uh, are improperly in possession uh, of firearms. Or with Prop 47, stealing a gun was lowered from a felony to a misdemeanor. And so we have been continually making law-abiding citizens into criminals by changing the laws overnight so what you've got in your safe is suddenly contraband. Uh, and then at the same time, we're sort of making non-criminals out of people who are actually committing crimes. Yeah, especially in the county of Los Angeles. Yeah. Because that uh, Gascon, I mean, just if you, if you haven't looked into what the DA in Los Angeles is doing, just do a quick Google search. You will find it is totally nefarious what's happening out there in Los Angeles. We've got to thank God that we live in Riverside County. For those of us that are here right now, uh, living here with a, an amazing DA, Mike Hestron, and, and an incredible Sheriff Chad Bianco. What a dynamic duo those guys are. Um, so let's talk about medical freedom, which I know for, for my audience is a huge issue. And right now we're, we're seeing with the, the AB 455, the AB 1102, these are, uh, they're trying to sneak this in and force us to get the vaccines. I've got so many people that, uh, that go to this church that I pastor and just my online audience that I talk with that are, are fearful. And we actually, we were the first church, um, in the state of California, we were the first church to come out with a doctrine against the mRNA. And that, that was for us, with our belief system, um, unfortunate for us, what happened was the Wall Street Journal wrote an article about it, which went across the nation, and then our, we, our phone service and our email service was flooded with people who wanted this religious exemption form. And um, that, that just shows you. People all over the states are calling this little church in Marietta going, I need that. So to us, this is a huge issue, and, and it's an issue of freedom. Um, and, and for me, it's an issue of I want my religious beliefs respected. Right. So if you were elected governor, what would you do to ensure our medical freedoms? Well, number one is I'd terminate the state of emergency. Yeah. That'd that be has, the first yeah. thing i do. Yeah. It's been a year and a half, and that has a couple of things. First, I think it's just, it, it's an important symbol, saying, you know, we're getting on with our lives. We're not gonna live with this pandemic mentality forever. And other states have, have terminated their states of emergency. It's time, and that, but secondly, and more importantly, uh, that is what is being used as the predicate for all of these emergency orders at the state and local level. And the way that our emergency services law works, and, and by the way, I wouldn't just choose to terminate the state of emergency, I would feel obligated 
to terminate the state of emergency. Uh, our law, the Emergency Services Act, uh, that's the, what the CESA was referring to in that uh, opinion you read earlier, uh, it says that the governor must terminate the state of emergency shall at the earliest possible date that conditions warrant. So we kind of know what this virus is all about at this point. We know how it works. There is no need to have a state of emergency. Everyone knows how to protect themselves. And so once the, what, what the law says is that as soon as the emergency ends, then all state and local emergency orders issued under it are wiped out automatically. And so in my view, that would include these mandates at every level of government. So um, at every level of government, but what if, what if a private corporation says, you know what, I know that the state's not mandating it, but we're going to mandate it for our employees. Yeah. You know, if you want to work at our company, you have to have this, I don't care about your religious liberties, I don't care what your, your church, that crazy 412 church over there, I, mean, I don't care right. what that maniac pastor says. Um, this is what people write about me, by the way. Uh, um, so what, what would you do to ensure that that can't happen? Because that really truly is a violation of our religious liberty. Yeah, it's a trickier issue, and it does kind of highlight a broader issue, which is that, you know, corporate power has in many ways become, uh, you know, uh, maybe not as much of a threat, but a threat that is, is similar in some ways to, to sort of uh, concentrated government power. Uh, social media, very clear example of that. It's a technocracy. Uh, where, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and you see, you know, this censorship, which I believe on, like, Facebook and Twitter has actually become a First Amendment issue, and it's one of the most important issues of our time, is to try to restore proper freedom of speech through those channels, since that's where so much of public discourse takes place. But to your question, so it is a trickier issue. Uh, I think that, you know, for the governor to sort of unilaterally uh, decree that private companies can't do this, uh, I'm not sure that would be within the bounds of, of what a governor could do uh, on his or her own. Uh, I think that, you know, if the legislature were willing to take steps in that direction, uh, it'd be a different story. Yeah, uh, well, we saw, you know, Governor DeSantis in Florida, he came out strong like that for the, for the people saying, no, we're not going to allow that. We're not going to allow people to to do that, right? And, you know, whether he gets the backing of the state legislature or not, I'm, I don't know. Um, right. But it's it's definitely an issue that that I have I have a church filled with people that are worried about that. Yeah. This is a, a massive concern for them. Um, so just know that 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 if you are to get elected, that's something we really care a lot about. We want our religious liberties. And we want our we want our <laughs> beliefs to be respected. Um, uh, one of the things I was talking to you about, because I've been involved in, in political issues prior to COVID, and one of those massive things for me, for me was the AB 329. That's the Comprehensive Sexuality Training, um, which, so it's not sex ed, like, like many of us got when we were in, in school, the birds and the bees and, you know, the, the, the biology of it, but it's actual sexual training, like how to be sexual, how to enjoy sex, things like that. And once that was introduced, all sorts of filth was allowed um, at a greater level. It was already happening on public school systems or public school campuses, but it just went on steroids. It, it was the, you know, that was the COVID, that was the pandemic in the schools then was the, the AB 329. So what would you do? Because I know that, that you've, you've helped... Um, with, with um, new laws, you've helped with the, the freedom of speech, the, um, the criminal justice reform, protections for sexual assault victims. These are all things that matter to you. Um, and then obviously school choice. So what do you say about the sexual indoctrination that's clearly taking place on our school campuses? Yeah, I mean, some of these materials are just truly shocking. And, uh, you know, I certainly am opposed to a SB 329. Uh, that was a bill that was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor, but actually a lot of the stuff that you're seeing uh, comes from the Board of Education and the right. various, uh, you know, uh, committees they've set up uh, to produce the curriculum. So uh, there is power, uh, you know, within the executive branch, which the governor leads, to potentially change some of that, uh, which I think needs to happen. Uh, you know, but this gets at, at another issue. I mean, in addition to the broader principle of school choice, uh, you know, there's also the matter of kind of where uh, decision-making power resides. And 
with that, you have an example of this uh, really radical curriculum uh, that's being devised in Sacramento and then forced upon every community throughout the state. And so what happens? You know, you as a parent go to your school board member who might be someone that you know or at least is more accessible than, you know, let's say the governor or someone in Sacramento, and you say, I don't want this to be taught to my kids. And what do they tell you? They say, well, there's not a lot we can do about it. This is a mandate that's coming down to us from Sacramento. And so that's what we need to change. I mean, I think that the most important job of the next governor is to make it less important who the governor is by returning power to local communities and their citizens, right? Right. Yeah, and that, that's like the never-ending circle I was in. I would go to the school board. they say, hey, well, we have no say. You've got to go talk to the California Board of Education. Right. So I'd fly up to Sacramento and talk to them. they go, no, this is a local issue. You've got to go talk to your school board. And I go back to school board. No, they said that I have to talk to you. Well, they go, oh, no, no, our hands are tied. And, and it's just, it's this. Right. You know, you know. Exactly. And, and the thing is, it shouldn't be like that. Um, so I, one of the things I resolved to do is, is say, I'm not flying up to Sacramento anymore. I'm starting with the school board. I'm not moving from the school board until A, they'll do what, what we want as a community, or B, we replace them and put somebody in there that will do what we want as a community. And once we get them on board, then we can go start going up the ladder. And, and so that's the approach we're going to take. But you're absolutely right. We've got to put the power back where it should be, and that is local, because all politics are local. Um, the, another thing within the public school system, and, and obviously it's not just public schools, this is everywhere in every woke corporation, but critical race theory has become a big issue. And I, I actually brought out a book that, that one of our, what, um, Pastor Simon, our executive pastor here at the church, he found this at a local store, and, and it's called Our Skin. And it's a children's book, and you open it up, and it essentially just said that uh, white people came up with the idea of race, and white people think that they're better and prettier and deserve more and all this nonsense. And this is the stuff that's being pumped into the minds of our young kids, dividing them up on race when, when we as Christians say, I don't want you to divide us up on race. We, we believe what Acts chapter 17 says, that from one blood, God made all people. And so we're all, we're all people. We're all part of the human race. And we don't want to divide by race, but then they, they go, oh, you're racist then. Look, no, you're the one being racist. So where, where do you stand on that, and, and what steps could you take as governor to ensure that critical race theory gets squashed on the state level? Well, I, I adamantly oppose it, uh, and uh, there's a bill right now in the legislature, as you may know, uh, that would not only allow CRT uh, to be taught in schools, but that would require it for every high school student as a graduation requirement, or ethnic, ethnic studies, studies is what they're requirement. calling it. But, so here's an interesting thing uh, that many people are not aware of. I was asked recently in an interview, can you name one thing that Gavin Newsom did right? And that was a really hard question. <laughs> 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 I had to stop and think about it. By the way, he's my constituent, Gavin Newsom is. He lives in my, I'm his assemblyman, lives in my district. Um, <laughs> for now, anyway. And so then I, it occurred to me, one thing he's done right is that he was against CRT two years ago. When the uh, original version of this curriculum was released, it wasn't just him, it was everyone. It was universally connected. Like, what is this? Newsom said, it is offensive in so many ways, and it will never see the light of day. That's what he said. Uh, the head of the, the California Legislative Jewish Caucus, which is 12 Democrat legislators, said that the curriculum, quote, echoes the propaganda of the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so you'd think, well, we should scrap this whole thing right now and never, you know, maybe we should figure out who came up with it and see whether they should keep their jobs after, you know, with cancel culture and everything these days. People have lost their careers for things a lot less serious than trying to teach Nazi propaganda to high school students. But no, that's not what happened. They said, we'll make a few tweaks, we'll make a few edits, we'll tone down the anti-Semitism a little bit, then we'll impose it on every high school student uh, in California. So that bill is wending its way through the legislature. I think it'll come to a final vote this week, and then Gavin Newsom will make a decision on whether to sign uh, or veto that bill. And unfortunately, you probably won't have a new governor before that decision. Uh, gets made, but you certainly could, uh, you know, try to roll it back if he does sign the bill. But I'll just make one final point on this, which is that we need to fight to defeat CRT. That is one of the most important issues right now, I think, that we face. But uh, I think that our goal needs to be bigger than that. What we really need to do is to restore civics in our schools, mm -hmm. you know, true civic education, because that's what CRT and the, this agenda has exposed, is it's exposed a vacuum, that we don't teach civics like we used to. You know, we used to think about education in terms of preparing our kids 
for citizenship, to be participants in the great American experiment of self-government, to understand why America is the greatest country in the world, what our founding principles and values are, so that then they'd be prepared to be active citizens in their communities, and we don't do that anymore, and so CRT has come along, and it's like exploiting that vacuum. It's saying, look, I call it the anti-civics. If we're no longer gonna teach our kids how to build their communities up, then we'll teach them how to tear their communities down. And so we need to defeat CRT, but we also need to start teaching civics again. I agree, great. <laughs> Businesses. Um, I know several people going through the last 18 months, businesses that they worked their whole life trying to, to build up, and it, it seemed like overnight they lost them. Um, what would you do to, to try to ensure that that never happens again, and also to try to create an environmental uh, environment of capitalism, an environment where people go, hey, look, I can achieve the American dream if I'm willing to work hard and sacrifice and, and right. continue to, to strive to do well, I can make something of myself here in California. Because a lot of people are leaving California because they think there's just no way. They're not going to make anything of themselves. They got to go to another state. And I keep telling them, don't leave, stay and fight. Stay and um, fight. We got to stay and fight. But what would you do to try to ensure that there's that kind of a, a, you know, environment where people go, okay, I can, I can achieve that American dream? Right, right. I like the way you asked that question because you know, California has always been sort of where the full glory of the American dream is realized, right? It used to be the state where anyone could get ahead, and now it's the state that so many people can't wait to leave behind. Uh, last year, our population declined for the first time in California's 170-year history, and not just by a little bit, by 182,000 people. And you talk about businesses, this is yet another example of sort of the theme of California kind of already being the worst at something, and then being like the worst of the worst during the COVID era. So we already were the worst when it came to how we treat small businesses. But then we had the worst lockdowns uh, of any state in the country. And what's the result? Uh, over the first half of this year, the number of business departures from California has doubled to what it was before. And it was already a lot <laughs> before. So, you know, I say Gavin Newsom, you know, has brought what was a long-term decline kind of into this total freefall. Um, and, you know, uh, the idea that uh, California is anti-business really, you know, needs to be more specific because what it really is is anti-small business. Right. A lot of major corporations, they like regulations. Uh, a lot of major corporations, they were exempted from lockdowns. Hollywood was exempted from lockdowns. Did you see that video from Angela Marsden in LA where her restaurant was closed outdoor dining and they got a film set across the street? I mean, that is California government in a nutshell. You know, it's the powerful uh, who benefit. And so big corporations, they can deal with the onslaught of regulations and everything because they have in-house compliance departments. They have attorneys on staff who can help them avoid litigation risks. They have big margins and can avoid the cost. They welcome this as barriers to entry for small businesses. But we've seen before COVID and we saw, especially during COVID, is it's the sort of, you know, the, the mom and pop store that's been on the same street corner for generations that, uh, that creates the character of the community, that brings the community together. That's who is who paid the price. Those are the establishments that died in droves. So how do we turn it around? Well, I think it's the same thing as when it comes to religious liberty and when it comes to economic freedom, is we need to not only, uh, you know, correct the abuses of the last year and a half, but turn the page on the whole, you know, reverse the whole trajectory that we've been on. And so I could give you, you know, some very clear examples of how we do that. Re overturn AB5, which is a ban on independent contracting, was absolutely devastated uh, a lot of freelancers. Uh, there are things like the Private Attorney General's Act, which is uh, a huge huge, uh, you know, which puts a lot of business, uh, a lot of companies out of business. Um, and then you could sort of go through the code. I mean, and that's one thing a governor can do is a lot of the damage is done at the level of agencies turning out regulations. And as the governor, you're the leader of those agencies, the leader of the executive branch. So you could immediately start uh, to create an environment that is actually supportive of small business rather than continually attacking them. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would, I wish I could say that I already know the answer to this question um, because you're a Christian, but unfortunately, I've had a lot of uh, people who who even fly. I, I they do what I call fly the banner of Christianity. Mm -hmm. They I'm a Christian, but then when you get down to um, where they stand on issues, they they might not necessarily stand on on what the Bible would say. So, um, would you consider yourself to be pro-life? Yes. Okay. So let me let me qualify that. I want to make sure that that we're both on the same page. Uh, what the answer yes means. Um, in the case of rape, woman's been raped. Or in the case of a woman's health being in jeopardy, mm -hmm. are you still against abortion? 
with those two things. So those are harder issues because there's federal law relating to that in the Hyde Amendment, which is... Well, I'm not talking about what the law is. I'm just talking about you personally, your belief system. Because as Christians, we want to vote for somebody who's closest right. to the heart of God. So I, I know what the federal right. laws are because, like I said, I'm on the board for birth choice. And so you, knowing that, you've got to know I'm you know, life is an important issue to me, but we don't have to agree on everything. Right. I just want to know for you and, and who you are, what's your thoughts? I mean, I think that uh, if you come at sort of the, uh, the, the pro-life position from the perspective that the, uh, that the unborn child is a life that is, uh, you know, it's the responsibility of the government to protect, then sort of the manner of, of conception uh, probably shouldn't factor into the analysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. I agree by the way. <laughs> um, what about the woman's health, though? What about that? Those are harder questions, I think, because uh, yeah. then there's, you know, there's, there's a real uh, a balance that needs to be struck. So I don't know. What's your opinion? Well, what, what I say is this, is um, when, you, when you leave room for abortion on any level, especially when it comes to women's health, that's such an ambiguous term. Yeah. Because now you're leaving it up to who to determine what is the woman's health condition. Is it just that she's stressed out from being pregnant and you know, the stress is causing her to lose some hair and, you know, it's just stress is bad for you, so this is bad for her health. You could get a doctor that says, yeah, this is bad for her health. Go ahead and do the abortion. It, it's so ambiguous that, that to me, there, it, it's not, you're, you're not drawing the line clear enough. Right. And so for me, I look at it exactly what you said previously is um, if we can determine that it is a human life, at, at all levels, then it's a human life, and it is the government's responsibility to protect it, um, especially as we grow further and further down the road of, of understanding science. You know, we look at, um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit older than you, um, so I'm a, I'm a different generation, but my generation, I'm Gen X, or Gen X, so my generation was not very pro-life, but you look at, um, you know, like my, my son is a millennial, I have a daughter who's Gen Z, um, their generations are actually more pro-life than my generation. The reason they're more pro-life is because of the understanding of science, because they understand that DNA is a digital code. They understand that, that everybody's digital code, everybody's DNA is unique to them. And so they understand that once that, once that sperm meets that egg, there is a unique digital code that is that person. And that's why you're seeing that, that advancement and understanding of DNA and how that works there. You're seeing that they, they understand that's, that's an individual person. So once that unique DNA is formed, that's a whole other person. And that person has rights, and that, those rights need to be protected um, wherever they're at in their development. Wherever that DNA is, you know, and it, it, you know, from that point until it ends up dying, it's that person. So that, that's how I view it. Um, but I appreciate you saying that it, you know, at, at those levels, um, at any level of that development, it's the government's role to defend that person. So I appreciate that. Um, let me ask you, um, as far as the border, obviously a border is a huge issue right now. Um, not, and, and, you know, some people would say, well, that's not a biblical issue. Why do you care? It's absolutely a biblical issue. Again, Acts chapter 17, where I said that, that from one blood, God made all people. Not only did he make all people, but it says that he defined the boundaries of their inhabitation, where he defined the borders. God's the one that sets them up. And so if God's the one that sets those up, God's the one that determines it, then to me, that's a God issue. That's a Bible issue. Um, any attempt to tear it down is, is just going against God's word. So to me, borders are, are important. Pastors should be talking about it. Um, but I, I understand that there, there's the political side of borders as well. So right now we've got obscene numbers of people violating our, our laws and coming across the border. And that is, in my opinion, is because of a failed presidency, namely Joe Biden. Um, you know, because we look at how it was going hey, before that. It's not clear to me who yeah, you're talking about. I was just making sure that everybody that hears me online, I know you all know what I'm talking about. But, you know, the thing is... Um, this is a problem. It's a problem for our state in particular, being a border state. This is a problem, and it's not getting better. It seems to be getting worse. What would you do as governor to, to ensure that the laws would be followed? Well, I'd do everything I could yeah. because, I mean, uh, it's absolutely, uh, you know, an uh, a untenable situation, what we have right now with 
uh, everything associated with it. You know, not only the, the inflow of, of people, but uh, the issues related to human trafficking, uh, related to drugs, not to mention COVID-19, mm -hmm. by the way. Uh, and uh, what we've seen is the consequences of this change in policy. Uh, so what could a governor at the state level do within the constraints of state power? Well, I do everything I could using uh, state authority uh, to try to staunch the flow of people coming in. There are limits to that, and I take the constitutional limits uh, very seriously because I've been very critical of the other side for uh, intruding upon those. A uh, very clear example of that, sanctuary state. Mm -hmm. This is what they decided to do in 2017, uh, and I would want to, I fought against that as my first year in the legislature, uh, which is just a terrible law, <laughs> terrible law. I mean, what it does, it specifically applies to criminal, uh, you know, and undocumented immigrants. So it doesn't apply to anyone but them, but people who, number one, are in the country, in the state illegally, and number two, have been detained for a, cr a criminal offense. It carves out a special protection in law for them to prevent your local uh, law enforcement from alerting uh, federal immigration authorities. It's a terrible, terrible law, and no one, you know, for, for decades has, would have ever, you know, supported anything like that. We've always agreed that the first on the list for people who need to be deported are those who have committed crimes. This is a basic idea. And then you have all of these benefits as well, like the, the governor just signed a bill that provided an unprecedented expansion uh, of Medi-Cal for, for undocumented immigrants. None of this is helping the situation. No, it's not. Um, so wh what do you think the solution is, though? Well, apart from, you know, having new policy at the federal level? Yeah. I mean, I think that the things that I just mentioned need to be uh, undone. So I would want to fight the sanctuary state bill in every way I could. You'd need to get a new law for it to be overturned, but the governor could uh, potentially sort of uh, ease up enforcement or provide ways to get around. In fact, a lot of local law enforcement departments have done just that. They found ways around it. Um, and it certainly stop any further expansion, try to roll back some of the benefits that, uh, that are in place. And then, you know, you've seen some governors get creative in terms of what they can do to use their own personnel uh, to assist at the border. And so I would certainly be interested in looking at what uh, I could legally do there. Yeah, so we, we watched what happened with, uh, with Governor Abbott and his border issue there, government trying to say, well, hey, you, you do the testing, the COVID testing, and we'll just reimburse you to do it. And he's like, no, this is, this is your job. This is a federal issue. You're guarding the border. Um, you do your job. Uh, we haven't heard much from Gavin Newsom uh, as far as what's going on on our border. One of the things I know for sure, we actually, I did a video with a nurse several months back that ended up going viral. And it actually sparked a Senate hearing on the issue of the border because they were flying patients from, from uh, down in Calexico. They would just cross over, go into our hospital, we'd put them on a helicopter and fly them here into our county. And it was, they would count them as a COVID patient there in that county. Then when they fly them to our county, they count them as a COVID patient wow. in our county. And there was flights going every 15 minutes. And we were tracking it on the, on the the app where you can track flights. We were seeing the helicopters all throughout the night, and they were doing it at night so that way people wouldn't see it. And so we... we so what we, happened with the hearing? What are they... Well, they, they brought out all sorts of statistics, and, and it shed a lot of light on it, but it's, nothing's happened. It's still happening, as mm -hmm. you know. You know, our border is just totally porous at this point. And the, we, we were getting numbers. There's over 100,000 people every day that cross our border every single day. Not all illegal, but I mean, there's over 100,000 people every day that cross our border. That's a massive amount of people. And what we're finding is it is, it is a huge problem for the COVID issue because they're not being tested. Here we are, we're being told to be tested every two times a week. If you want to have your job and not have a vaccine, you got to be tested. But then the border's open and they're just flooding across. That is, that is very poor mismanagement on our state. Um, and I, and, I, and I think that fault rests on Gavin Newsom. So should you become governor, then we're going to be looking to you. Okay, what are you going to do to right. stop that from happening? Right. And I'll tell you this, I'm not, I'm not against immigration. I, I'm, I just want immigration to be done properly. I want people to, to do it legally. And, and I know this for a fact because I've, I've been involved in trying to help people get their family here from another country. Because I was involved in doing missions work. When you're involved in doing missions work, people go over as missionaries and they end up getting married and they have kids in that state or in that, in that nation. Then they want to come home to America and they, can't, they have trouble getting their kids here. And the, the system is broken. The system is flawed in many ways. I mean, some of these questions like, are, are ridiculous. No, no question about ISIS. 
No question about anything like that. But they're asking about, are you a part of the Nazi Communist Party? Like, what? Like, that, that's a long time ago. That shouldn't even be a question on there anymore. But they're asking those because it's been so long since they've revamped any of these things. And it's really, really difficult to do it legally. Yeah. Extremely difficult. And I think that's wrong. We need to change that. But this would, if you become governor, the, the, that's the fact is being, being at the top is lonely. Well, it's it, lonely because, you know, the buck stops with you, and that's, that's, that's hard. That's true. You know? um, and I think that, you know, that's inherent to, to political leadership is that you have to make difficult choices, and, and people, not everyone's yeah. going to be happy. In fact, I'm pretty sure that, you know, everyone in this room could probably find at least one vote I've made in my thousands of votes that you disagreed with. That's the way it is. But I think that what you can do in leadership is, you know, is, is the way you reach decisions is often just as important as the decisions you make. And bringing as many people as possible into the process, I think, is, is vitally important. And kind of like what I was saying before, you could also sort of uh, decentralize uh, the locus of decision making uh, down to the level that is as close to the affected communities as possible. And that's where we think we've gone so haywire over the last year and a half in particular, but even before that, is that, you know, decisions right. that affect people's lives in such direct and intimate ways are being made from afar. And so I favor making decisions at the level as local as possible. And by the way, the most local level of decision making is that of the individual citizen. Right. Amen to that. That's <laughs> something we can't ever forget here in America. Um, okay, we're running out of time. I want to just give you an opportunity. Look, we, we, we know there is a lot of bad stuff going on. So as we close, just leave us with some encouragement. What, 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 what could you give us to walk away from tonight feeling encouraged? Well, look, that's not hard at all because we have a, a, a golden opportunity right now in 10 days to set the state on a whole new course. I mean, I, you know, I've been in the legislature for five years and I've been fighting against the corruption and the supermajority and everything else for five years. Um, and right now we have a chance to just completely change the game. And it's not because of anything that politicians like me have done. Uh, it's not because of anything that the state party has done. It's because of what people like you have done, folks who are in your communities uh, and have said enough is enough. We're going to fight back. Stay and fight. I love that you said that, Pastor, uh, because that's exactly what we see happening. And I think that, you know, I've been traveling the state uh, quite a bit. Turns out it's a big state. Uh, <laughs> in the two months since I started this campaign, I've been to the most conservative communities. I've been to the most liberal communities. I had one day where I was in Bakersfield and Santa Cruz. Unbelievable amounts of energy everywhere. And the thing about the recall is it's not something that's just, I mean, of course it's driven by anger and frustration and, and everything else that, you know, we've had to go through uh, over the last year and a half. And of course it's driven by uh, dislike, shall we say, but for Gavin Newsom. But this is not a movement that's, that's purely about negative emotions. What I see, you know, most of all is a sense of optimism and hope that actually we're going to demonstrate the power of a free people to make tomorrow better than today. And I think that when California does that, it's going to send shockwaves across the nation that, you know, we're going to come out of yeah. this dark year of government control. We'll yeah. light a new spark of liberty. I agree with you 100%. I've been saying this for a long time. We are going to see a great awakening here in America. And when you study the great awakenings that have happened previously, there's always been a high concentration where it, where it begins and then it goes throughout the rest of the country. Yeah. Like in the first great awakening, it was New York and they had the burned over district in New York. Um, and burned over because people were on fire spiritually. So that was that, what that was. And I believe with this great awakening, California is going to be that epicenter. I really, truly believe that. So uh, thank you for, sh for sharing that. Thank you for spending your time with us tonight. Um, I hope you can hang out. And I can, yes, absolutely. People and stuff. I know you guys want to get a chance to, to talk with them, ask <laughs> you your questions. <laughs> um, thank but thank you. you so much. And God bless you. And God we'll be bless. praying for you. All right. All right. Um, all right, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. All right. I want to just remind you, don't forget this coming Wednesday, we've got Charlie Kirk coming out. You're not going to want to miss that. You're not going to want to be late because you won't be able to get in. So this Wednesday, 7 p.m., we will be live streaming it uh, for those of you that can't make it. Also want to uh, remind you that Monday morning, I've got a special Bible study right here at 412 Church in Marietta. It's going to be at 9 a.m. It's just going to be a, a, an hour-long Bible study that I'm going to be doing. For those of you that don't know, it is uh, Rosh Hashanah that day. And I want to explain to you what Rosh Hashanah is in the Bible and what that means and what, what are the things that we're supposed to be looking for prophetically 
when it comes to the Jewish calendar. The Hebrew calendar is massively important to us, to us as Christians. So this Monday, 9 a.m. right here, and can't wait to see you guys. God bless you. Well, hey, I really do hope that our guest today and our time together was a blessing to you. I want to ask if it was, would you please share this video out with your friends on social media? Also, hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe to us so that way you can be updated every time we have a new episode of Our Watch. Uh, again, blessing to have you with us, and we hope that you have a blessed time being effective for the kingdom in the culture that we live in.